What's up, everybody? And we are back. This time we are talking about interviewing and the skills of interviewing and what is interviewing and what do we ask and how do we do it. Lots and lots of fun stuff. Boy, do we have a good product for you. Billy Mays here. Boy, do we have a great lecture for you. Introducing the skills of interviewing. It's just like I'm repeating the same jokes. I don't know. Hopefully you guys are getting some use out of this, but we're going to talk about uh, interviewing today, the skills of interviewing. How do you talk about it or how do you ask the questions? Uh, what kind of questions do you ask? How do you get the information? What information do you need? There's all kinds of stuff we need to go over in so little time. So let's get right to it. We're going to kick it off right off the bat with a piece produced uh, by our Harbor High School television students. And this is a great example, example and, and we'll kind of talk about uh, how they were able to do this and, and why uh, asking certain questions and uh, what we're capturing is important to convey information to the audience. So without further ado, go ahead and take a look at this. Vision. It's a platform. It's preparation for life after high school here at Harper. We do more than just discipline and credit checks. In fact, we exceed the expectations of brick and mortar schools spanning across the nation, teaching students to become contributing members of society. Uh, we're out here trying to recruit uh, seniors and juniors into the National Guard. Uh, just trying to help get their way through college, uh, make for a better future, you know. Part-time service, full-time benefits. Whether you're looking to go to school, maybe have a blue-collar job, or just want some training or leadership skills, that's what the National Guard is for. You can join as a junior, that's when I joined at the age of 17, but uh, if your plans are to go to college and actually pursue further ed education, whether it's something like a blue collar job or a traditional four year college, then that's what the National Guard is for. Help you pay for school and also give you those um, skills to actually help you succeed in life. BMX has the incredible opportunity to collaborate with the National Guard, decent exposure and raising awareness for an incredible cause. The National Guard kind of sponsors the action sport company we ride for. It's called AGA Nation, and they send us out to schools all over the nation, just perform and um, put on a good show for all the kids. Basically to get exposure about the National Guard, who we are, what we do within the community, and things like that, just to basically show our face, show what we can offer, and the wonderful people that we work with. Nothing comes easy to an athlete, especially with such high expectations and difficult tasks to undertake. It's not impossible, but it takes drive and dedication. I have been riding for 17 years. Um, I've been riding nine years professionally. I started doing uh, stunt shows straight out of high school, and I still compete and work on a few movies here and there. I'm doing stunt work. I ride about eight hours a day when I'm home, um, four at the least. Um, so a lot of training goes behind the scenes. Practice. I mean, uh, no, none of this comes overnight, uh, no matter what you're doing riding a bike, playing basketball, baseball. It takes years of practice to build up the muscle, the muscle memory, uh, just the confidence to do anything, really. An intense journey to say the least, but it will forever be worth the extensive hours. These guys are impacting lives daily and living out their dreams in the process. I guess we kind of give back to the communities by doing these shows. I mean, we're out here risking everything just to do a uh, 30 minute show every day of the week. It's not always easy, it, it does get really hard at times, but if you just get back up when you fall down, you'll go in some amazing places and the journey will be unreal. Whether or not you decide to join the National Guard, anyone can take away life-changing lessons from these professionals. It takes drive and dedication to succeed in life. Thank you so much to our military for serving our country. Your service does not go without recognition. For HPWN, I'm Ashlyn Grace Brothers. And there you have it. That's a pretty neat story. Uh, there is actually a funny story behind this. So we do, oh look, there I am. If you look on the left side of the screen, uh, blue shirt, top row, there I am. And I, this ties into the story because uh, what we were doing, uh, we do... We broadcast more than any other school in the entire state. We do about 120 broadcasts a year at least. So that's a lot. The next closest school does roughly 40. So we do quite a bit of work. Uh, this was like towards the end of the year, right? And uh, 
they announce that there's going to be this special pep rally. And I look at my students and I go, guys, you want to try and broadcast that? And everybody was dead. We had just done football. We did all the basketball. We did volleyball. We've done pep rallies. And you name it, we've covered it. Bands, choirs, graduation. We were tired, right? And so they look at me and they go, nah, we don't want to do it. We shouldn't, right? So we get there and this is what happens. It's the only pep rally I've never live streamed, right? And it's the only one that I'm right here. If you look on the left side of the screen, uh, you can actually see me with my phone and I'm texting and I'm texting uh, our, my students and I'm like, we should have broadcasted this. This is incredible, right? So that's what happens when you miss out. Just broadcast everything and you always have it. We have this footage, but it's not the same. I want to live in the moment. Anyway. I digress. Let's move forward. So this was a neat story. Uh, we'll use this as an example uh, throughout this uh, lecture. Um, so let's take a look. All right. So what information are you collecting slash looking for when you're conducting an interview? Well, you're looking for four different things. You're looking for facts. Most importantly, if you go back to Ethics 101, your main job is to seek truth and report it to provide information to the public. So we're looking for facts. We do like emotions, right? Uh, everybody likes the emotions. That's, that's what makes people relate to other people, okay? Opinions, we do want opinions. However, we have to be careful because everyone has an opinion doesn't mean that it's necessarily correct. I use uh, Trump uh, as, as a reference a lot just because everyone has an opinion about Donald Trump. Whether it's positive, whether it's negative, it, it doesn't matter. Everybody's got an opinion. Now, which one is correct? I don't know. That's a tough one. So you got to be careful with opinions. And then eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts we'll get into in a second and I'll explain what that is. But those are the four. Facts being the most important, emotions being second, and then those other two we're kind of like, uh, we use them when we can. All right, so let's move forward. The goals of interviewing are, as I said, facts are the most important. That gives you the information. And that is to get the five W's, the one H, and I added this on uh, about three years in, the so what. Okay, so the five W's, who, what, when, where, why. One H would be how. We'll get into that in a second. But who? Who was involved? What? What was it about? What happened? When? When did this occur? Where? Where did this occur? Give me a description of where this occurred. Where, be visual, right? Show me the shots of where it occurred. Why? This is probably the most important. Uh, why are we covering this? Okay. And uh, let's see here. How? Uh, how get an account of how it happened so who what when where why and how and then I added on uh, so what now uh, I play this as a uh, devil's advocate for my students personally because they'll come in uh, and they don't really care about their projects and that shows when they start editing when they start shooting they're just like that let's just get it done right so whenever they come to me with a story I always ask so what Okay, I always ask, so what, to make them, show me that they're actually interested and passionate about this. So I have, uh, for instance, a student came up to me and was like, hey, uh, uh, we've got this story. It's about uh, how this student has suffered these, uh, this debilitating disease and they need this uh, kidney transplant. And so right off the bat, I'm like, okay, so what? Not to be mean, that's a very uh, sad thing, but so what? Why do we as viewers care about this, right? And then we find out, well, he's involved in athletics through Springdale. He actually attends Rogers High School. Uh, he's been doing this for years and years, fighting this battle and this disease. And we're trying to create awareness uh, to get money for his surgery. Okay, well, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So by doing this, we're creating awareness and we could potentially save someone's life. To me, that's very valuable. 
So always play devil's advocate. So what? Why do we as viewers, why are we invested? Why do we care? Why should we watch this? Okay, so five W's, one H, and then the so what? All right, your goals. Uh, emotions, that's the reactions. Why was this important? How will it impact? Okay, eyewitness accounts. These are people that were actually present. So an eyewitness at this uh, uh, extreme bike thing, who was an eyewitness? Literally anybody there. Literally, literally any student in the, in the stands that could tell us what happened. Opinions, uh, in your own words, that's explaining what happens, uh, what you saw, uh, and what you think will happen next. Again, we have to be pretty careful with opinions. That should say, who do we interview? I don't know why it says why. Typo, let's just scratch this whole lecture, start over. No, it says, who do we interview? Uh, there's two types of people that we interview. The uh, official and then the witness. The official is always somebody that's in charge. They typically will answer the five W's in one H. They'll typically take up the majority uh, of your, your package. Your package is what you're going to assemble. The witness, however, gives us the relatable material. This is going to be why we care. They give us the opinions, the, emo the emotions, the eyewitness accounts. For instance, let's go and uh, do a story about a man whose wife just drowned. You get out there. Who is an official? Who's somebody that you can interview that's an official? Paramedic, a cop, right? Somebody in charge. They can tell you what happened, the five W's and one H. The witness, who would be the witness? Probably the husband. We would really want that because he's going to definitely give you the emotions and make that content relatable, right? Or you could have eyewitness accounts, anybody who literally saw what happened. For this package, Extreme Guard, who is the official? Very good. Somebody in charge, that would be, let's go back so I don't mess this up. Uh, right here, Sergeant Brown would have been the official. Okay, so you have Sergeant Brown. Uh, who would be the witness? Any students, teachers, right? You could also, uh, Ashlyn, who's uh, now working at the Tulsa market, it's great. You can also use these writers, like Logan Place, uh, who technically is an official. He can tell you what's going on. Um, so let's, let's just answer this. Who? Who is this about? Well, it's mainly about this bike, this extreme... Uh, guard uh, AGA Nation and they are a bike uh, extreme trick riding group that travels around the country. Okay, who? But you can also say it's about the National Guard, which is definitely true. What? What is it about? Well, they are traveling around the nation and they're doing these shows for schools to raise awareness for the National Guard. Okay, when? When did this occur? Uh, I believe she says it in her uh, stand up. Uh, this past spring or something like that, okay? Uh, who, what, when, why? Why is this important? Well, they're trying to recruit people for the National Guard, uh, so we're trying to raise awareness. Uh, who, what, when, where, where it took place at Harbor High School. Uh, how did it happen? Uh, well, it happened uh, through uh, the National Guard promoting this. They sponsored the AGA Nation bike people uh, to come out here and do it. So what? Why do we care? Well, the students were uh, very captivated by this. They got the crowd involved. It was a very unique pep rally, one of a kind, probably won't happen again for 10 years. So this is very unique. Okay, so you answered all those questions. All right, back to this. Uh, so you answer, or you have two different people, the voice, the official and the witness. So now let's apply all this and let's take a look at this piece produced by Samantha Lewandowski. In a time of division within our country, two of our students from the Springdale Public School System have taken the initiative to advocate for equal immigrant rights throughout the entirety of Arkansas. 
Arkansas Unidos es una organización Arkansas United is a non-profit organization. It has given essential services, such as legal services. It's advocating for the best rights, equal rights, for the immigrant community. So I was a volunteer intern at Arkansas United. Um, I actually specialized in the legal uh, department of the organization, which means that like when people would come in uh, for their appointments for things like DACA citizenship, um, TPS, all those sorts of like immigration uh, legal processes, I would sit down with them and help them work through their applications. And I'm also on a thing called the Arkansas United Youth Council, which is a group that works to implement solutions for youth in our schools um, and, and get youth more involved in politics. Es muy importante el movimiento the movement that has been generated the last couple of years by the Dreamers through the young leaders is very important because they came here young. This is the only place that they know, and they want to study. They want to carry on and have that right. With over 50% of the student body at Harbor High School represented by minorities, the work that Eric and Jax do on a daily basis at Arkansas United is crucial to the growth of the Springdale Public School System, and for student leader Eric Soto, a more personal motivation. With Arkansas United, I was able to find a connection there because my, fam my mom, she was separated from me and she still is, and she might not be here when I graduate. And I want to help others um, be together with their families and, you know, find them together. And maybe those who don't have a legal status here find a way, uh, a path to citizenship. I loved being part of that work of, you know, lifting others up and making them feel like they were, like they belonged in our community and like they were wanted. Estos jóvenes son maravillosos. They are marvelous. I call them my favorite leaders. When I see Jax and when I see Eric working together, it makes me have hope, have a lot of hope in society, and that the near future is going to be good. If we have more leaders like Jax and Eric, surely our future is going to be great. With an estimated 48% being a minority in Springdale, Arkansas, Jax and Eric have a very simple but inspirational message. Never give up, to always continue doing what they do, and that no obstacle is too big for them, and anything can be possible if you are determined. I just want these students to know like, that they can do the things that everyone else does. Like, that just because they have like, the status of being an immigrant doesn't mean that they can't go to college, doesn't mean that they can't get a job, doesn't mean that they can't belong in this country just like everyone else. They have you know, the opportunity to make a change and to be a leader if they choose to do so. In the words of Athletic Director Wayne Stellick, we are many schools, but one community. And the progressive work that Jax and Eric have accomplished is making progress towards a more equal society. For HBWN, I'm Sam Lewandowski. I always make fun of her for the very ending of this because she didn't actually finish saying her name. That's always important. Give yourself credit for uh, what you completed. So. We should be able to tie all of this in and answer who, what, when, where, why, and how did this happen? How is it happening? Okay, uh, And then obviously the so what? Why do we care as viewers to be involved in this? And I think this was a pretty powerful piece. Uh, so pretty neat. Uh, just remember, when you go into your story, go ahead and lay it out. Make sure you get those questions answered. If you do your interview and you look back and you go, actually, I didn't cover how this is occurring. Ask a question to get that answer. All right, let's move forward. Here we go. Uh, so first things first, we always, 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 always make sure you do this very first thing. You hit record and you have them say and spell their first and last name and give you their title. Okay, we do this for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, I, used, I used to have a student, believe it or not, his name was Hertzong Tong Kong Sum Fu. I'm not kidding. Hertzong Tong Kong Sum Fu. Why do I know that name? Because it took me like a whole semester just to learn his name, how to say it. Forget spelling it. There's no way I can spell it now. But if I said to a student, I wrote this name down and I say, go interview this guy, right? All they have is this name written on a piece of paper. They have no idea how to say that, right? So they go interview this person, they pull them out, they set up the interview, and they go, okay, Mr. Hoxintra Kamsim Fu, right? Now you probably offended this person, uh, you, you look like you don't know what you're doing, so it's always appropriate to say right off the bat, can you say and spell your first and last name, and how, or not sorry, can you say and spell your first and last name and your job title? If it's a student, they'll just say, I'm a senior at Harbor High School. 
I'm a sophomore at Rogers High, right? If it's a teacher, uh, I'm, I teach anatomy and, and physiology at Harbor High School. I am the head principal of Harbor High School. Okay, so uh, make sure you have that title. Why do we need that? Number one, uh, to say it, right? So they will say the name. So if you don't know how to say the name, they will say their name. And now you know how to say it. Or he may say, my name's Hurt Song Tong Kong Song Fu. You can call me Hurt. Well, that's a whole lot easier than call, calling him Hurt Song Tong, right? So uh, make sure you can say the name. Number two, we now have the spelling. They are going to spell it on camera. You've recorded this. They're going to spell it, which we can then incorporate into our lower thirds. That's extremely important. So we know how to say their name. We know how to spell their name. We know their title, and we can use this for lower thirds. Always very important. Make sure the very first thing you do is have them say and spell your name. Bonus, you have to adjust your audio, right? So while they're saying and spelling their first and last name, you can be adjusting your audio and camera to get the levels correct. Instead of you going, hey, can you give me a mic test? And they sit there and they go, check, check, testing, 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 right? Probably not going to be accurate levels, but if you say, can you say and spell your first and last name, and they actually spell it in their normal voice and tone, now you can adjust audio and get a very good, accurate reading. So this is very important. The very first thing you do is have them say and spell their first and last name. All right. Questions. A question is any statement or nonverbal act that invites an answer. What? Statement, nonverbal act. It does not have to be something followed by a question mark. It doesn't have to be. Don't believe me? What if I said, um, um, uh, let's use the example, uh, Trump is building a uh, border. Somebody comes up to me and goes, Trump's building the border uh, around uh, Texas, keeping all the immigrants out from Mexico. And I just look at you and I go, okay. Naturally, you want to reply. Whether it be like, oh, you don't think that's a good idea? Oh, right? You want to reply. So it's, it invites an answer. It does not have to be a question. You can certainly ask questions. Those are easy. You can also use nonverbal cues. Now, I can't show you the nonverbal cues, but for instance, Trump's building a border wall around Texas, uh, cutting off the immigrants from Mexico, and all I do is nod my head. Right? That's inviting you to continue, to say more. So it could be a nonverbal act. It could be eye rolls. I wouldn't encourage an eye roll during an interview, but it certainly could be. Voice emphasis. Now, uh, be careful with your voice emphasis because these all mean different things. For instance, the common phrase, why do you say that? Okay? Or, if I said, uh, let's say a student said, my favorite team in the um, Major League Baseball, MLB, my favorite team is the New York Yankees. Why do you say that? Well, uh, they've had more championships and blah, 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 and they've got the best team and the most money. Okay, okay. so they're giving me an answer. What if I said, why do you say that? Now they feel like they have to defend, like it's their, their personal opinion. They're defending themselves. So they're going to be a little bit more uh, forward and stronger with their answer as opposed to, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Why do you say that? Right? They have the most money and the best players in the entire league. Why do you say that? Well, if you look at it, they've, they've had Derek Jeter in the past, and they've had, uh, who's the Hall of Famer catcher? Yo is that Yogi Berra? I don't know. They've had Babe Ruth, right? They've had all these, okay, you get it? So they're defending their answers, so make sure you have uh, used the, or practice voice emphasis, I should say. All right, the unskilled interviewer, they're thinking ahead of the next question. Uh, they anticipate questions prematurely. They're in a hurry. They get uncomfortable if there's a moment of silence. Okay, 
I've seen this a lot from unskilled interviewers, especially sophomores uh, that are just starting out, where they have all these questions on a piece of paper written down, okay, and they never look up. The person's talking, uh, the interviewer is just sitting there nodding their head, but they're looking at this piece of paper. It's very important to maintain eye contact. Um, and it's also important to listen. It's so important, right? What if you were doing a, I said, go do a story um, on your principal and what they're doing as far as precautions uh, with COVID-19 and students in school, right? So you walk down there, you set up your camera, you get to your principal and you say, okay, uh, sir, can you just tell us a little bit of, about the precautions that you're doing with COVID-19, right? And he starts talking, you look down at your piece of paper, he starts talking, you're not even listening. He's like, yeah, uh, the students, uh, they're going to be a lot, they're going to be safe in the schools. I want them to feel safe. I was in my office the other day uh, smoking marijuana with my assistant principal, and we were just talking. And, right, you don't even notice that. You say, okay, that's great. But now you have a whole separate story. I'm sorry, what? You were smoking marijuana with your assistant principal? Do you see how you need to pay attention to what they're saying? Because... If you go out there, don't be afraid to change your story. By the way, this never happened. Uh, but uh, don't be afraid to change your story. If you have one story, and then you have a bigger story that just falls in your lap, that's your story now. Go with that. Don't get uncomfortable with their silence. I did a video uh, for the state of Arkansas a long time ago. I'm going to say almost 10 years ago. Uh, but this video was for suicide prevention. And so they were trying to promote um, awareness uh, that you're not alone, uh, that it's important, that there's people there for you, and there's, you know, you get the idea. So uh, I went out uh, and interviewed all these people who had um, some type of relation with suicide, whether it's their family member, they tried to do it themselves. Uh, so I was interviewing this. The final person I interviewed was the person that actually ran the suicide prevention for Arkansas. So she sat down and she starts talking about uh, her brother who had committed suicide. Very sad, right? And so at the very end, I mean, it was a great interview. At the very end, I looked at her and I said, uh, if you could look at your brother right now and tell him one thing, what would it be? And it got really quiet. And she didn't, I mean, it must have been 30 seconds, 40 seconds go by. And it's really, really quiet. Nothing said. She's just staring at me. Now, if you're an unskilled interviewer, you would probably say, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll move on, right? Or you would probably try and break the silence. But in a situation like this, it's so important to let it sit and let it mellow. Let them think about what was just said. Because what happened was, after like 30, 45 seconds, uh, she just started breaking down into tears and crying and saying how much she missed him and that it wasn't his fault, and, right? It was a great piece. We ended up using it in the video and people were in tears at the end of this video after watching it at the, at the uh, event. So, uh, very powerful. Don't be afraid to sit in silence. Now, if I had sat there and like three minutes had gone by, I'd probably say something, but you gotta realize and know the timing. You know, that's a very powerful and weighted question. So for 30 seconds to go by, that's not really that big of a deal. So don't be afraid to kind of uh, sit there with the silence, go with it. The skilled interviewer fully understands their angle, okay, listens carefully to each answer, uh, and they use follow-up questions. What is an angle? An angle is the direction you want to take the story. For instance, let's say uh, I'm going to assign you a story. Donald Trump is building a wall to cut off immigration to the United States. Boom. Naturally, if you're very un, uh, very new to the area or new to the area, new to the industry, you probably would just do a straight story factual based. Donald Trump is building a wall. Fact. 
Here's how much it's going to cost. Fact. Here's where it's going to go through. Fact. Here's when we ex can expect it to be completed. Fact. That's one side of the story. That's one angle. Another angle is maybe somebody else says, you know what? He's building this wall, but I'm going to interview people in Mexico and I'm going to interview families and talk about how uh, this is going to affect them. I'm still going to give facts. This wall is being built. How is it affecting you? But now we have a little bit more of an emotional story. So you could definitely take that angle. Same story, different angles. All right, so now we have open questions. Open questions are very broad. They often only specify a topic. And there's lots of freedom when you ask these types of questions. Okay? Highly open questions. There's virtually no restrictions. For instance, tell me about yourself. You could literally answer that a million different ways. What do you know about our school? And again, there's so many answers to that. Tell me about. So many answers, right? So open questions, you can talk forever. Open questions allow a lot of discussion. Moderately open questions now contain a little bit of restriction, but still allows a lot of leeway. How would you respond to this statement? Okay, so there's a restriction. We're talking about one topic now. What comes to mind when you look at this picture? Now we're restricting. It's this picture. What is your reaction to the statement? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this narrows it down a little bit. Okay, the advantages. They're probably going to talk. They're just going to start talking. Open questions, they're just going to start talking. Uh, they're probably going to answer the five W's and one H. It's going to promote trust. Usually easier to answer. Promotes conversation. That's so important to me. When I conduct an interview, uh, I'll start talking to them before we even start rolling. Hey, did you hear about the hogs? Can you believe their schedule this year? Right? We just get them talking, talking. And you need to have trust when you're interviewing somebody. Otherwise, they're going to be locked up. The disadvantages, a significant portion of time. Oh, my gosh. Some people will go out there to interview teachers. Uh, and they, teachers, you know which teacher you are that talks a lot. But uh, they'll go out there to interview teachers and they'll use the mistake of an open question. And that teacher will talk for 30 minutes. Think about that. Think about sitting there listening to one answer. So they can talk a lot. They may dwell on an important, uh, unimportant information or veer off topic. They can, they can skip important information, assuming it's too obvious. Okay, so there's definitely some disadvantages to open questions. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum is closed questions. And they're very restrictive and may only supply options. Okay, so for instance, a highly closed question, uh, they must select appropriate answers. For instance, what is the highest education level you've achieved? Some high school, high school, college, graduate school, masters. There's only so many answers, doctorates, okay, GED. Like, there's only like six answers that you can, you can uh, give. Moderately closed, uh, generally most of your five W's and one H come from here. Uh, which chemistry class have you had? So there's a bunch of different answers that you can give. Uh, how long have you collected baseball cards? Again, different answers. All right. Bipolar questions, on the other hand, they only limit you to one of two possible answers. Do you purchase coffee with or without caffeine? Okay. One of two answers. They can be used for evaluation. Um, do you agree or disagree with the court's decision? Are you for or against Donald Trump? Do you approve or disapprove the school's decision to separate students on the dance floor? Okay, the most obvious bipolar question is the yes or no question. This is what I call an interview killer. Do not ask yes or no questions. Because remember, the answers that you get, that's what you have to edit. So let's say you're doing a story and you say, uh, did, you, did you hear that 
the Hogs are, are probably not going to win a single football game this year. Yes. So now all you have to edit is him going, yes, no, yes. So do not ask bipolar questions. Those are conversation killers. Uh, the advantages, you can control the length of the interview. Uh, they require little effort from anybody, and they're easy to write down. Disadvantages, very little information. Doesn't really talk about the why. Uh, they don't have a lot of opportunity to have a conversation. So the best thing to do, to do is use both types. Use open questions to uh, start the conversation. Use closed questions to clarify. Um, so using both is definitely going to help. Um, open questions will make them more comfortable. It's going to enhance conversation. Um, you can use both in the same question. Who's your favorite teacher and why? That's a closed and an open. Who's your favorite teacher? There's only so many teachers that you can talk about. Why? There's a lot of answers. So don't be afraid to use both. The secondary questions or the FU questions. FU, follow-up. Okay, so FU, the follow-up questions, are used to uh, elicit further information. These are often called probes. All right, who's ready to get probed? I know I am. Let's do it. The silent probe. Again, I wish I would have set up a camera for you guys to see this, but uh, when you feel the answer is incomplete, remain silent. Remember, a question is any statement or nonverbal act that invites an answer. You can remain silent. That's a type of question. You can use your eye contact, you can nod your head, you can sit back in your seat a little bit, you can gesture to them, go ahead. Um, but if you use this correctly, it's so helpful. Why do we want to use probes? Well, have you ever been in the middle of a thought? You start talking and blah, 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 and then somebody interjects, they start talking too, and then you try and remember the point that you were trying to talk about or go back to what you last said and you cannot remember. So, using these probes allows them to continue their thought process without you interrupting it, breaking it. So that's the silent probe. The nudging probe, okay? Uh, this can be a, like verbal information, okay? Trump's building a wall, uh, cutting off immigration. I see. What do you mean? I mean, he's building the wall, that's going to blah, 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 blah. Go on. Right? So those are just nudging. You're just kind of pushing them. Pushing them to the answer that you want to try and get out of them. The clearinghouse probe. Oh, the most important probe that we have is the clearinghouse probe. The very first thing you do in an interview is what? Have them say and spell their first and last name, right? The very last thing you do in an interview is called the clearinghouse probe. Okay, the very last thing. It lets them know that everything's wrapping up, that we're finished with the interview, uh, but it's real simple. You always ask the same question. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Most of the time they're gonna go, mm, nope, I, th I think that's it. But sometimes they'll go, you know what? Yeah, actually I wanted to say blah, 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 blah. And sometimes those are the best sound bites. Those are great. So make sure you use the clearinghouse probe at the ver very, very end. Again, it's always at the end. What's at the beginning? Have them say and spell their first and last name. Informational probe, okay, uh, used to get more information if you think it's too superficial. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about what you said here. What happened after the car accident? How did you react when, right, so these are pointing out specific details and getting more information out of it. Restatement. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, you'll get people who say things that have nothing to do with what you're talking about at all. Okay? Use your vocal emphasis to draw attention to what you're getting at. Do not embarrass. It's so important. 
don't embarrass or antagonize the person. And I think I have a couple examples. So here, <clears throat> the interviewer asks, what do you think of the proposal near Oak Bluff? The interviewee, interviewee says, I'll tell you one thing, it's about time we put brakes on the government in this country. The little guy doesn't count for much anymore. Does that have anything to do with the proposal? No. So the interviewer would say in a restatement form, yes, but what about the park proposal? Can we see how we emphasize words, park proposal, to really draw that out? Oh yeah, the park proposal. Okay, so that's a restatement pro. Number two, uh, you can uh, restate so they understand a little bit better. Um, define responsibility for me. Well, um, it's, uh, um, those are called fillers. People use fillers to um, help the flow of words come out. So they'll just start saying things and, um, you know, uh, 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 it's while they're thinking of the actual words they want to say. So you could use a restatement probe. In your own words, what does it mean to be responsible? So you're just restating the question. Reflective probes allows you to verify accuracy or to clarify what they're saying. Okay? Uh, for instance, if somebody says, my favorite amendment by far, is the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment gives you the right to free speech, right? And so you, could, you would then say, don't, don't you mean the First Amendment? The First Amendment is the right to free speech. Oh yeah, the, the First Amendment is what I meant, okay? So that will give you clarification. Um, you could say something like, was that net? I make, I make uh, this is true, I make 300 million a year. Okay, is that net or gross? That is net. I am a millionaire that just likes to teach, I know. Um, so you have reflective probes. Okay, we're wrapping up here. So listening tips, make sure you're on the here now. Concentrate on what they're saying. Do not just read your questions. Have a conversation. It's okay to have questions written down. I always encourage my students to have at least five written down, but I don't expect them to only have five when they come back. Surely the person they interview is going to say something where the, that's interesting that spurs another question. So listen. Practice conversational listen. You should not speak uh, or should not let them talk so you can talk. You should let them talk so you can gain information and ask more questions. You're gaining information constantly. Okay? Um, you're definitely going to get better sound bites if you practice conversational listening. Listen uh, for facts, listen for great quotes, listen for elaboration. Remember, what they say becomes the material that you can edit. If all they say is, yep, uh-huh, yes, no. I remember one of our football players, uh, Josh Frazier, was an incredible football player, went to play for Alabama. I'm pretty sure he went to the NFL for a little bit. Uh, but he was horrible to interview. Because all he would go is, yep, yeah, uh-huh, yes, yes. Josh, you uh, had 14 sacks and 17 touchdowns last night. Uh, what do you think led to the Wildcats' success? Yeah, we, we play football. <laughs> right? So it was very difficult. So make sure you're asking questions to get that conversation going. Uh, be responsive. Make eye contact. Oh man, that is so important. Make eye contact. Shake their hands. Well, you won't be able to shake their hands now, but uh, maybe maybe a high, air high five or something. But eye contact. Let them know you are listening. I have the same practice. I do this all the time. I look them in the eye. I nod twice and I smile. Nod twice and a smile. Maybe I'll do one of those. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Smile, right? So you're nodding, smiling, so you understand there. They, it looks like you're listening to them, even if you're not. Okay, so that's a very, very important. And finally, uh, pay attention to their behavior. Uh, I always encourage uh, taking psychology at some point 
in your education career, whether it's in high school or college, because psychology, the, the, the practice of seeing people and observing them has been so helpful to me. For instance, if you conduct an interview and somebody has their arms folded across their chest, what does that mean? It's a defensive mechanism. They're trying to protect their chest, their vital organs. So uh, subconsciously, believe it or not, they are trying to protect themselves. They don't feel comfortable in the situation. If you're interviewing somebody, you're seated, seating, you are seated, they are seated, you ask a question and they lean back in their chair. What does that mean? They're trying to escape. Again, they don't feel comfortable. They're trying to create more space between you two. They don't like this, the situation they're in. If you are conducting an interview and the per you ask a question and the person leans forward, what does that mean? Oh, they're trying to close space. They like you. Good job. Great for you. Uh, so there you go, guys. I hope you guys uh, took some of that to heart. Hope you gained some information. Um, the skills of interviewing, the five W's, the one H. Remember, the first thing you do is say and spell their first and last name. The last thing you do is the clearinghouse probe. Is there anything else you would like to add? Is there anything else you'd like to add? No? Good, great, grand, wonderful. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.